Hello, hockey fans, and welcome to the Hockey News Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Fraser, today here with Ken Campbell, Ryan Kennedy, Matt Larkin, not here on vacation. Mm, day to day. However, I stole his eyebrows. <laughs> really, eh? Put them in my beard. You only needed one of them. Felt like I needed more foliage <laughs> in the beard. Right. Took his eyebrows. Double, nice. double nice. the girl. Double breath. Nice. You would have had, that would have given you some like really good mutton, mutton chops. chops. Yeah. yeah. To all the people eyebrows. not watching the video version of the podcast, no idea what we're talking about. Exactly. <laughs> do not switch over because God knows you do not want to see the three of us. Nothing to see no, here. Mm. Nothing to see here. Carolina, Boston, lots to see there. Indeed. Especially if you're a Boston Bruins fan. Teams that have gone down 2 0, 7 and 47 all time. Not looking good for Carolina. Can they bounce back? Ken. Uh, no, I don't think so. And, and I, I think this is just a function of the fact that when you're as low, low seated as the Carolina was, sometimes you're good for an upset, sometimes you're good for two upsets. But three upsets is a little too much to ask. And I, I, I just think, you know, the deeper you get in the playoffs, the less chance there is for a team like Carolina to advance. Because sooner or later, reality slaps you in the face, and I think that's what's happening here. I mean, you know, Jacob Slavin got turned inside out in game two. You know, their penalty kill's been terrible. Uh, their goalie's been a little leaky. All the things that really were coming together for them in the first two rounds, um, they, they've all kind of fallen apart. And I, I think even after the Washington series when they were down 2-0, you know, they could sit there and say, yeah, there have been times when we've outplayed Washington in this series, and we're kind of still in this. I don't get that sense now. Yeah. I, I get the sense that they're looking at this series and going, you know, as, as Justin Williams said, we ate a poop sandwich in games one and two, and uh, there's not a lot to hang your hat on going back home for games three and four, other than going back home. Yeah, and that is the old adage that, you know, a series hasn't really started until the home game loses. But, you know, as home you pointed team. out, uh, home team, um, as you pointed out, Ed, in the conference final, 7-47, and 47, that's a little more dicey. And it, it just feels like with this Bruins team, they have so much experience. And I know Carolina has Justin Williams. But this Bruins team, they just, they know themselves. They know each other yeah. so well. And they're so smart as a team. And I think that really came through, particularly in Game 2, where... You know, so many of those goals were of the variety where Carolina was just scrambling around and all the Bruins were in exactly the right place to make things happen. And it does kind of feel like the conference final can be a, a pretty big letdown in terms of the competitiveness. It feels like that happens more frequently Because teams have beat themselves up through the first two rounds. Yeah, and one yeah. team shows up and the other team is, they've, they've run their course. And, you know, hopefully we get a bit more of a competitive series and maybe Carolina can, can find themselves back in rally. But, again, like the Bruins, they're just a very, very good hockey team. And, yeah. and that's hard to come back on. And they're but, dialed in. Like the Bruins yeah. are just completely dialed in right now and and one of the reasons why I picked them to win this series the main reason why I picked them to win this series was because of Tuka Rask I think Tuka Rask is playing the way championship goalies play mm -hmm. and 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 I just you know as 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 great as uh Mrazek and McElhenney were for Carolina I just you know I mean the pedigree is completely yeah. different right um and that was sort of the main thing for me and I, I think that's bearing it out now I think you know Rask is still super dialed in and he's he's playing really well and now you're starting to see the you're starting to see the chinks in the armor in in, in Carolina and it's I mean it's to be expected you know I mean they're they're a good team but they're not as good as they're not as good as no, the Boston they're not Bruins Boston. they're not as good as the Boston Bruins they're not yeah. Yeah. and so I, I find that the deeper you get into the playoffs the more reality sets in I want to circle back to Rask because I feel like we're seeing a new Tuka Rask this time around like he he was a guy who was Never questioned for his skilled level, ever questioned yeah. for his skilled level. The mental part of his game was questioned. I don't think that that's been in question for a second in these playoffs. It's oh. been rough on goalies. He's, you know, not once has he had any signs of cracking whatsoever. And I wonder if part of that is because hockey fans in Boston are just idiots who keep wanting to run him out of town. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, like, this year he really got... He really got put through the ringer that way, and I'm wondering if it didn't, 
you know, strengthen his mental resolve, you know, and, and that sort of thing. Because now he's he seems impervious to that stuff. And like, you know, Matt Matt Larkin, our our usual host, has often said, you know, you guys don't deserve Tuka Rask and Boskin <laughs> because of the way you treat him. So I, I'm wondering if that might be part of it. But I mean, this guy is. This guy's a pro's pro, right? Like he is, he's, he, when he gets I, dialed in, he's, he's one of the best. I also wonder how much Halak has helped him there. Uh. I mean, to take some of that load off <clears throat> and to not have to be the guy. And just to have somebody to, to talk to. Yeah. You like never know that dynamic. Yeah, exactly. Because you're not seeing the freakouts with Rask that we used to see yeah. during even regular season games when things didn't go right. Totally. Like you're seeing yeah. a lot more yeah. controlled and... If anything gets hairy around his net, if there's scrubs, he just skates off yeah, to the side. He's like, I'm not getting involved yeah. in this. And, I mean, the results speak for themselves. It was funny in Columbus in game, I can't remember, game five, I think it was, or game four when Columbus scored uh, that goal that hit the, that hit the netting. Oh, yeah. Pe- people were talking to Tuka Rask about that after, and they said, did you know it hit the netting? And he said, no, I had no idea it hit the netting because if I had known, I would have been screaming and chasing <laughs> after linesmen and breaking my stick. <laughs> so it was probably better for him that he didn't. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't aware. Ignorance, Ignorance is, is bliss. bliss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jinx. Here's, oh, here's, here's, here's my issue. Boston's out playing them. They're killing them. It's over. Yeah. But to borrow Ryanism, this is the pear-shaped playoffs. Right. Nothing goes according to plan. Mm. Right. How does Carolina not win game three, blow them out in game four, <laughs> and we're all sitting here next week going, this is a th- it's a- Carolina's a much better hockey team than we thought they were. I mean, yeah. nothing has gone according to plan. I, I mean, it could happen, and, and, and it may, but... It doesn't feel like that this time. It just doesn't. I mean, against Washington, they were playing a lot better. They're not, like, they're, as you say, I mean, they're, they're being dominated in this yeah, series. Yeah. And unless, unless they turn this thing in a big way and get some serious momentum on their side, um, you know, the, the, the deeper into a series you go with momentum, the harder it is to lose. And, and I know that was a big thing for Joel Quenville. It was always like early in the series, he'd, he would always tell the Blackhawks, let's get the momentum and hang on to it for as, as long as we can. And because, you know, it can be such a fleeting thing. So the longer you hang on to that momentum, the better chance you have of winning it. I, I just, you know, I, ju- I just think that even in a crazy playoff like this, you know, certain truisms evolve, mm. and one of them is There are that, certain infallible truths. Right, and, the and, and the one of them is is that the deeper you go in the playoffs, the better chance the, the really good team has to win. And I think that's fair, because when, <clears throat> when was the last time a true, true, true underdog won it all? Well, to, Not L.A., well, not when they were in A.C., because yeah, yeah, they weren't a true well, underdog. And plus, by the time they got to the final, it was against New Jersey, and they weren't... That wasn't really... That wasn't really that lopsided sure. at all, at all. And yeah, I mean, it, it very rarely happens. I can't, I'm sitting here, th- I can't think of one. But yeah, by the time you get to the final, usually, almost always the better team wins. Yeah, when, the, the by cream the of the crop. The final. Yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. I think at that point, you are, as weird as it sounds, you're relying more on your skill than you are on grit and determination, which you can get by right. in round one especially, right. and into round two. Yeah. But as, you, as the playoffs go along, Cliche time, the cream rises to the right. top. Right. I think in 2009, Pittsburgh and Detroit, maybe. But even then. Or Edmonton. But neither of those teams were true underdogs. I mean, and I'm, ta- I'm yeah, talking, yeah. The, I guess I shouldn't say, I'm talking Cinderella. Yeah, no, right. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. Oilers when they lost. They didn't win. Games. They didn't win. They didn't win. They didn't. Yeah. They made it to the final. Right, right. Thanks they did. Yeah. Yes. yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, turning to the other series, uh, I, I, I think there's an argument to be made, actually, that as bad as Carolina's been dominated, St. Louis was dominated even worse. Right. San Jose right. Right. ran rough they shot feasted, over They feasted that on was, every turnover. That, yeah. I, I'm looking back and going, Winnipeg, why didn't you play <laughs> like San Jose was playing yeah. against right. St. Louis? Yeah. Uh, Bennington looks like... Human. He, he looks human yep. for once. And he looks um, like Judge Reinhold. <laughs> He does, actually. Yeah. yeah. I'll give that to you. Know, you. So, so I'm going to say so does Tuka Rask because... Tuka Rask looks like everyone. Tuka Rask looks like everyone. <laughs> but, but he actually doesn't look like Jordan. <laughs> doesn't look like Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jordan Bennington, not a friendly guy. 
He's not not real. He's he's, he's at not least, fuzzy. Not warm and fuzzy. He's, he's not he's, warm and fuzzy. He's uh, is he just dialed in, or is that just? Do you think that's just kind of the guy? He is? I I don't know him from Adam, so I I don't know whether or not that he's always been this way. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that he seems really like really dialed in at the moment, mm-hmm. and this has probably worked for him. Um, you know, Martin Jones on the other side. I mean, he's he's friendly enough, but he's he's dull as dishwater too. You know, so I think I if I remember the last time I talked to Bennington was at like the Memorial Cup when he was with Owen Sound and he was pretty friendly as a teenager. I think it's just a matter of like the stakes are pretty high here and you don't want to give anybody bulletin board material, yeah. so he's gonna he's just gonna be that normal still kinda quirky goalie, but he's not gonna be like you never know what Pumping has tires. to. You never know what has to go into a guy's mental preparation, right? And yeah. if that's if he's being told by his mental skills coach, block it all out. I want you at a zero all the time, no yeah. emotions. You don't know what. The, I mean, th- he's 26, 27, 26, I think. Yeah, twenty five because uh, he's still. Oh, yeah, he's twenty five. Yeah. Okay, twenty five. Yeah. Um, you know, not that it doesn't take a lot of goalies a long time to, to settle into a number one, but he's a bit of a late bloomer, I think is fair to say. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, big you, time. You know, whether his issues <laughs> were potentially mental, I, I don't know. We're, he's due for a feature in the Hockey News magazine, mm-hmm. which, of course, you can subscribe at at thehockeynews.com. Exactly. And it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you don't know what goes into this process, but that, I, I did wonder that as I'm watching, is, is this guy, guy who's just really in the zone and he's not going to, well, he's not guys, opening up. Yeah. Some guys get it, get beaten down too, right, as they go through their careers. Like I remember Dion Phaneuf when he first came into the NHL, he was super quotable and, yeah. and, and like he was, he was really friendly and outgoing and everything, and then now it's like grumbly answers. So, mm. you know, th- sometimes you get that. You get that kind of beat. And the playoffs are especially. I always tell guys. I always tell guys when they're young, like, don't change. Don't don't right. let this happen <laughs> to you. Yeah. Because it happens so often. And Jack Hughes will be an interesting. I don't want to yeah. go off too much, but Jack Hughes, who you interviewed for don't Future change Watch, a thing. like don't just change a thing, the Jack perfect Hughes. personality, exactly yeah. what the NHL needs. Yeah. Does he get beaten down? You I know? hope some guys. Some guys yeah. come out. And Crosby was like, Crosby kind of has come around in a good way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, he's opened up a bit and been willing to share a bit of himself. I wonder, though, like, going back to the goaltending thing, like, a guy like Martin Brodeur, though, who, you know, no superstitions, never let the way to the moment. Talked on, talked on game more. Forget game all this days. BS yeah. about, I don't do this, I don't yeah. do that. Yeah. None of it. Mm-hmm. None of it. And arguably the greatest career. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I wonder how much of this is guys just taking it a little too serious. Well, I, I know everybody's got their own. It's your comfort level, right? Yeah. It's your comfort level. It's what you do and, and how you prepare and how you feel before games. Like, I mean, Glenn Hall threw up before every game, and he was one of the greatest goalies ever. I, I threw up before I came in here. Uh, really? Had nothing yeah. to do with nerves, though. No. Yeah. Had some bad French fries. <laughs> True story, bro. Uh, but we're supposed to be talking about <laughs> Martin Jones in this segment. I think we went through. Oh, really? Uh, I think we okay, went through well, five Martin minutes. Martin Jones. I'm going to no, talk no, no, about no. Martin but Jones. Let, let, me talk, let, me, let, let me set it up first. Guy struggled during the regular season. I think everybody going into this playoff said San Jose's a great team. Can their goaltending hold up? First couple of games against Vegas. Those questions were still there in a big way. Martin Jones now. Well, you talked to it. I mean, unbelievable so far. Yeah. Um, and I think this is a really interesting study in the things we were talking about, about backup goalies and everything. Okay, mm-hmm. so I think the turning point of these playoffs came before game five in the first round against Vegas. After, after four games, Vegas was up 3-1. Martin Jones had been pulled twice, and his eight, save percentage was 838. And Peter DeBoer, probably out of necessity more than anything, said, Martin Jones is our guy. And we're going with him. We're, we're starting him in game five. Mm-hmm. He gives up two goals the next game, wins. Then he gives up one goal on like 500,000 shots in that <laughs> double overtime game. And away he goes, right? Um, I, I, think that's a, I think that is the complete turning point for the San Jose Sharks in these play. Well, <laughs> the, the Pavelski. <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe but, but, one, but of. one of the huge yes. turning points. And, you know, I know Matt's big on, like, you got to have a guy pushing you and everything like that. Well, see, in this situation, they didn't really have that. They had Aaron Dell, and they could have brought him in, and chances are they wouldn't have gone Come very on. far. They're not bringing in But Aaron you know what? Dell. They stuck with the guy that was their guy 
the guy who had a terrible regular season, who didn't even have a 900 save percentage of the season, I don't think, um, you know, and then they said, you know, look, you're our guy, win or lose, we're, we're going to live or die with you, and it turns out now he's, he's delivered. You just got to get hot at the right time. Holby yeah. proved that last year. Yeah, I also wonder, too, if the way the Sharks are playing in front of him has evolved as the games have gotten more serious. Because if you think about yeah. that San Jose team, particularly on defense, they have two of the most dynamic blue liners in the world in Brent Burns and Eric Carlson. Guys that are great at driving possession, but when they make mistakes, they are bad mistakes. <laughs> now, in the regular season, you can kind of get away with that. You know, if you, you know, if you make a mistake and you give up a goal, it's not the end of the world. But once you get into the playoffs and things are so tight and every game matters, I wonder if either consciously or unconsciously, guys like that are taking that extra split second to say, maybe I shouldn't throw the puck out in front of the net, or maybe I, sh maybe I need to dig a little harder in the corner, whatever it happens to be. And they're making those little plays that are helping their goaltender, who, you know, I mean, when in the past couple of years, when Martin Jones is on his game, he's a pretty good goaltender. Sure, sure. Maybe, maybe he's not top 10, but he's top 15 for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. He, he just has to not hurt your team, especially that's on... Right. And, and that's what's happening like now. And, and, and that's what's I, happening I, now. I think that's what's happening right now. Is he's, he's, not, he's not knocking the doors off of nope. this, this thing, right? He's, he's doing the doors exactly off of this thing. what he He's, to, he's yeah. playing well enough to help his team win, and his team is scoring three or four goals a game. And, yeah. and, and But I do think, I, I really do think that his defense is playing way better in front of him. I think Mark Andre Vlasic is... Uh, Mark, Edward, Edward, Mark, Mark Edward Vlasic yeah. is having a way better playoff than he had as a regular season. I think mm -hmm. Eric Carlson is having a way better playoff than he had as a regular season. And I, I, you know, I mean, through much of the year, the San Jose Sharks were a team that just gave up an incredible chance after incredible chance. And they gave him up in bunches. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're not, as the playoffs have gone on, I think you've seen that become less of a way that they're playing and like they're, yeah. they're, they seem to be a lot more stable. Well, I think confidence begats confidence as well yeah. because if, if I was to describe um, Jones's game at this point, it would be confident. Like mm -hmm. he, he looks in control yeah. out yeah. there. There's no nervousness. Everything is, everything is coming easy to him. And to me, through the eyeball test, that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate, um, uh, measure. measure of a goaltender. I mean, that's why Carey Price for so many years yeah. totally. was the best because it's like post to post, no problem. Yeah, you can, you can, are you kidding <laughs> me? Yeah, I've yeah. got this. Don't waste and my that, time. And that's yeah. a, just very calm in his positioning, and everything is just the game's coming to him right now. Mm -hmm. it's, there's no, there's no, and the team I think feeds off of that too, and especially sure. a team that likes to be. Can't believe I'm actually using this word proactive on offense and activate the defenseman. Uh, they're going to give up some chances, and you have the willingness to do that, the ability to do that when you've got a goaltender who's confident. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I wonder, though, uh, you know, one game sample with St. Louis uh, is is have we have are we are we, we going to see a rebound from St. Louis in this series? Is is this is this going to be basically a San Jose? four or five game or, or to San Jose or to St. Louis have another level to give. Oh, for sure. And yeah. I think that, you know, what we've seen with this Blues team is that when they're on, I mean, they can grind and they can play heavy. They're, they're playing really good playoff hockey. Mm -hmm. And you think they're coming off a seven game series against Dallas that went into overtime, a very emotional end, you know, Patrick Maroon, the hometown boy scoring the goal. There's, there's going to be some letdown. Okay. And I think game two will probably see... I'm not saying St. Louis is going to win necessarily, but it'll probably be closer. And I think what we'll see is a, a more traditional Blues game uh, from this postseason. I, they have so many good elements that I, you can't write them off yet. Well, yeah, and again, though, you can get through one round, you can get through two rounds sometimes. You can get through one round without Val, uh, Vla, uh, Vladimir Tarasenko doing much. You can get through maybe two rounds without him doing much. Mm. You can't get through three rounds. You can't. He's got to have more than one even strength goal. Mm. He's got one five-on-five -five goal in the playoffs. Yep. And he's got five goals, one of them even strength. They need more from him. He's got to step up. And if he doesn't, then they're, they're just not going to win. And it, to me, it all goes back to Bennington. And, and if the confidence level starts to degrade throughout the lineup there, because he was the St. Louis Blues since January yep. and yep. for the first two rounds of the playoffs. Yep. I mean, they were outplayed 
I would I still say 65% of the time, 65-70% of the time in the Winnipeg series. A little closer in, in Dallas, but still that was a close series. Uh, so to me, I mean, we're making predictions at this point, but I it wouldn't surprise me one bit if this is the end of the road. And that could San be, Jose, could be, could yeah. be. it's yeah. just, I, I, that, that one scares me more than, I would expect, I almost expect Carolina to rebound more than I do St. Louis. Huh, interesting. There's just something about, again, the goaltending when you yeah. rely so heavily right. on the goaltending, right. which right. St. Louis has done. Yeah. Um, I want to turn to coaching vacancies for a second. Assuming nobody else um, uh, gets fired, got two vacancies out there, Edmonton, Buffalo. Uh, Ralph Kruger's a name that's getting bounced around. That'd be a bit of a weird one for Edmonton. <laughs> yes. No, it's not happening in Edmonton. I, it's if it happens, it'll, it'll happen be Buffalo. Buffalo. Yeah. yeah. So, well, let's let's talk about that then. Is Ralph Kruger a good head coach for the Buffalo Sabers at this point in their development, or lack thereof development? Yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean, he's been away for three years now. Uh, he was the chairman of the Southampton Football Club. Um, he had. That seems like a weird transition. To yeah, me. it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. He. It's. It, he's. He's. I mean, he did a great job with the with the with the uh, what were we what were we calling him? The, yeah, Team, Team Europe yeah, in, yeah. in 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 the World Cash Grab of Hockey, um, <laughs> and had a very you know had a really really unfortunate situation in Edmonton where it was just so dysfunctional that not even Toe Blake would have been able to to do it. So I mean, the body of work. Toe Blake uh, reference. Yes. Yeah, the body of work is. I guess it's it's. Incredible, um, you know. I, I, it seems like an odd choice to me. Don't it seems it? like it seems like a really odd choice to me. If you're if you're the Buffalo Sabers, like you know, and and I'm I'm like I'm always against this recycling old guys mm. and bringing them through again. But don't you have to bring in somebody who's got some credentials to them? Like I like I would you know a Dave Tippett, even a yeah. Sheldon Keefe. Like to me. A Sheldon Keefe? That, a guy who's proven himself to be able to work with young players. A Keefe, I think, is a good, mm-hmm. yeah. good man. Well, you know Botterill a bit. Is, is Kruger a type of guy who fits a Botterill type team? Well, I will say that if you look at Kruger, and he was only in Edmonton for a year, but he, I think he is a teacher. And I yeah. remember talking to Nail Yakupov, I, I don't know if it was that season or the season after, but he was talking about how... Kruger was helping him work on defense and you know they were in the video room and he was getting him engaged in it and Yakubov was starting to improve. how did that turn out? Well how what happened (laughs) was the Oilers fired Kruger. Yakubov had like four coaches in five years and that's what happened. And I mean that to me that's always been a great unknown is what if Edmonton kept Ralph Kruger on? Would he have been able to turn that group around no. and help develop them? <laughs> but not his fault. <laughs> like, well no, but I mean that's when they still had yeah. Taylor Hall. If they had Joe Blake in Edmonton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, if they had some semblance of continuity in Edmonton, right. what would that have meant for those young players who at the time were still kind of in the embryonic NHL stage? So I think that there is something there, and it's it's a tough situation for Botterell because, you know, Housley was a first-time NHL head coach when he came in. Right. So, you know, Kruger, it wouldn't be his first time as an NHL head coach, but there's not a huge resume at that level right now. So would that be, you know, too much of a, a similar pedigree, or would that be enough where, because Kruger's sort of been through it all before and he's seen things at different levels and on different continents and even different sports, would that be slightly different? I think that, you know, Buffalo is the type of situation where, if, you know, as you were saying, Ken, if they went with a Dave Tippett, if they went with an old hand, I could understand that. You know, for me, Los Angeles was more of the situation where they could have gone somebody young and new mm-hmm. and, and, you know, changed that culture. Um, but with Buffalo, I feel like you need a stabilizer right now. And, and maybe that is Kruger. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% on it, but, you know, if you think about some of the other guys we've talked about over, the year, uh, over this year, you know, the Scott Sandalins, Pascal yeah. Vincents, Troy yeah. Manns, you know, they're all, they're, they're all first-timers. I'm not sure if this is the time for them in Buffalo, yeah. which is unfortunate. But 
that might just be the reality hasn't, of the situation. Hasn't Dallas Eakins earned another opportunity to coach in the NHL? Yeah, that would you be know? a good one. I mean, I think that would be one that, but but obviously he's waiting for the you know Anaheim. he's he's <laughs> he's waiting for Anaheim, right? Yeah. So. What about, a, what about a win now guy like Guy Boucher? Because is Buffalo not in win now mode, or at least make the playoffs now mode? I know you're yeah. in a brutal division, yeah. just a brutal division. But what about a guy like Guy Boucher, who's Ooh. good for two? He's good you, for two how, years. Yeah, he's but how do you hire? Years. How do you hire a guy who just led the worst team in the NHL? Like that, that was the that was the yeah. coach of the worst team in the NHL. Optics I, I, wise, that's yeah. you're right. Yeah, yeah. And if you're Buffalo, it's like. You know, I mean, why don't you just, I'll just, I'll just stand here and you can kick me in the shorts again. <laughs> like, I don't, I just don't, you know, I can't imagine that that would be something that they would want to do. So let me put the Kruger question this way. Is he a potential home run pick? Because is he a guy who can come in and he, he might be a disaster, might be Edmonton all over again, but he also might be, he sparks yeah. a run out of a, because you got to get by Boston, Toronto, Tampa, you need yeah. a huge home run. Mm. So can he be that guy? I guess he can, but the, the problem is it's risk reward at this point, right? Yeah. Like do, if you're Buffalo, do you want to risk that? Do you want to risk the possibility that it could go or sideways? Or you can just keep middling along and yeah. being mediocre. Yeah. 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 I say he's a ground rule devil. <laughs> Not a home run, ground rule double. Uh, I'd li- I'd they like- would take that. Yeah. They would take that in <laughs> Buffalo. We'll take a ground rule double for Buffalo. All right. Yeah. Okay, turn it away from the NHL for a second. Uh, uh, World Championships. Capo Caco, five goals already in this tournament. Mm-hmm. Jack Hughes, goose eggs. Ryan, is, are we starting to talk about looking at Jack Hughes maybe not going number one at this point? I guess we have to at least ask the question. Sure. I just did. Yes. <laughs> so, mission accomplished. First of all, well done. Um, but, I mean, it's really tough. And it's kind of funny because, you know, Ray Shiro just had this happen to him two years ago with Nico Heischer and Nolan Patrick. And obviously he went with Heischer and it turned out to be a, a great decision for the Devils. Uh, he has played very well for them. Uh, helped Taylor Hall win the Hart Trophy as his center. It's, it's difficult because, you know, it's a pretty big stage and it's also a stage where, you know, people in Europe, uh, particularly Finland, have an affinity for this tournament. So when they see their boy doing so well, it's like, ah, Kako's better than Hughes. And I'm not saying one's better than the other at this point. Um, they're very different players. What I would say is that, you know, you have to look at the entirety of their seasons, both of which were remarkable. You have to look at their positions, a, a pure center versus a winger, yeah. who I, I think could play center one day, but Kaka, is, he's not a center right now, and that's fine. He's obviously very good. But, you know, you have to think, you know, what does New Jersey want? What are they forecasting? And I was thinking about it this morning. I think the best comparison right now would be the Taylor Hall, Tyler Sagan. I was going to say exactly the same thing. Yeah, because at the yeah. time it was like, yeah, Hall's going first. Why is this a debate? Well, it's a debate because Tyler Sagan's really good. He's putting up a lot of points with Plymouth. He's a center. Hall's playing wing. And, you know, we spin this out. We look a decade later. Yes, Hall won the Hart Trophy. Uh, but Sagan's been one of the better centers in the NHL. And it's hard to find premier centers. And I think that's what you have in Jack Hughes is a player that is still ascending. You know, like Capo Caco is already NHL sized. Jack Hughes, he has NHL speed, Mm. but he's gonna get stronger in the next two, three, four seasons. So what is peak Jack Hughes versus peak Capo Caco? We don't know yet. And that's the challenge for the New Jersey Devils is do they believe in the upside and the trajectory of Jack Hughes versus this really beguiling present of Capo Caco, which also has upside right. and also has a great trajectory, but which is going to be better for New Jersey? And it's a fascinating question. Yeah. For me, it's like, I don't know how you could turn down either one. So by that sort of flawed logic, I would still go Jack Hughes because I don't want Jack Hughes to turn into like <laughs> super Patrick Kane. But on the other hand, Capo Caco could be another Austin Matthews. So you, you can't lose, but in, a, in other ways, you might not be able to win. Well, I, I think you've, you've really hit on something. I mean, you have to look at these guys five years into their careers to yeah. figure out 
which one you're going to take first. And and you can't do that. They don't let you watching do them in a <laughs> in a you know a three week tournament, right? Yeah. Um, Capo Caco has two of his goals are empty net goals, but that that means something. That means he was out there for a very crucial time in the game. Yep. First of all, so so I'm not I'm not diminishing that. Um, but I, I think again, you know, and and Ray Ray Shiro and Paul Castron, the the, uh, the, the Devils, Devils GM, the Brain Trust, they are there watching this. So I would think that they've got to at least be having cause for pause here to look and say, okay, wait a minute, you know, I mean, we really have to look at this really, really closely. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're right, Ryan. It comes down to. How good is Capo Caco going to be in five years, and how good is Jack Hughes going to be in five years, and which one's going to be the better player? Mm. And I mean, they've they've both got such an incredible body of work. They both set records this year. They they were both terrific players. Um, Caco's doing it on the world stage now, both in the World Juniors and in in the uh, in in the World Championship. Whereas Jack Hughes, you know, was a little bit banged up in the World Juniors. Yeah. Um, didn't couldn't deliver. Well, couldn't single-handedly, him and Cole Caulfield couldn't deliver the under-18 championship uh, for the U.S., who was expected to win. And now he's kind of a third-line guy on, on the U.S. team. So, boy, it's, it's going to be an interesting it's going to be an interesting decision. I still think it goes to Hughes, um, but I, I think you've got to be looking at this and going, okay, wait a second, maybe it's not a slam dunk. Yeah. In a market, let's if it's a tie, <clears throat> if they really. Can't come to, does does a player's ability to sell the game in that market have any impact? Jersey, they struggle with attendance when they're not winning. I think yeah. now, you know, I just I happen to have, you know, have had some talks with people about this. I think New Jersey now, with the new ownership they have, they have an entirely different marketing approach than they did years ago where now it's, it's more about the personalities and it's about the devils. It's, it's not so much about just winning and, and letting that be your, your marketing yeah. ploy. Um, I think the fact that like Taylor Hall and Nico Heischer, those are the faces of the franchise right now. So whether it's Hughes or Kako, I, I don't think it matters on that front okay. because they don't have to be the guy. They don't have to be doing every single interview during the year because there are other star players on that roster. And I think that, you know, the way New Jersey is evolving as a business will help and it'll also mitigate, you know, whichever player they take. But long term, and Ken, you know, you spent some time with the Hughes family, assuming Jack doesn't change and doesn't get beaten down, this kid has the potential mm -hmm. to become a bright light superstar. Yeah. Yeah. He has yeah. the personality. And if he, he, and, is, and, he beams. This and, kid. and if and if Capo Caco goes first, he's going to be able to do it in New York. Yeah. You know. Good I mean. So that's another thing. I, I think there's some interesting things here. First of all, I, I look at this as maybe a potential Crosby Ovi rivalry because mm. no matter what happens, one of these guys is playing in New York and the other guy's playing in New Jersey. Good so you've boy. got that you've got that rivalry there, yeah. right? Um, and and so so I think that will be really interesting to watch. And secondly, I, I'm not sure I wouldn't rather be Jeff Gordon right now. Totally. Be the New York Rangers. Yeah. It's just like okay, you can't go wrong. Okay, absolutely. We don't really have to worry because yeah. whoever you don't take, that's who we're taking. Yeah. So you know, I mean, it, it's kind of nice to be in that seat right now. There's a lot. There's you know, nobody's going to be second guessing. The Rangers in ten years. No. <laughs> People might be second guessing Ray Shiro in ten years, but nobody's going to be second That's guessing. A good point. Yeah. Mm. Nobody, nobody, because it was like these two guys are so far ahead of everyone else. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, and I do think Jack Hughes does have that possibility to, be, to transcend the, you know, to transcend the game yeah. and and to be this guy that is one of the faces of the game because he's. He's so super confident. He's so super comfortable in his own skin. He just says what he wants, and, and but he doesn't say it without like sounding like a dick. He says it uh, sounding like a real confident, sure of himself kid, which is exactly what he is. And that's the NHL needs some more of those guys because the superstars in the NHL right now, yeah, don't have great personalities. And I, I, I that, that, that's not meant to, to for to be offensive. No, because you, you are who you are. Yeah, mm. but. You know, there's nobody who is who just 
draws you in, who you're right. just like, this, I want to be best friends with this guy. Never mind, he's one of the greatest players. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, McDavid's a little standoffish, I would say. He's guarded. Comes he's off guarded. that way. Crosby is, he's just so singularly focused on the game itself. Yeah. It's not, so I mean, it's, again, no fault of these guys, but just to have the guy who beams. Yeah. I think yeah. that that, to me, is, I mean, the NHL, I don't, I think they would be happy to have him in New York for that reason. Yeah. But New Jersey, a team that, could use a bit of a, to me, I, yeah, okay, you can have all your different marketing efforts, but five years from now, if you can have a guy who's the face of the NHL, because you can be the face of the NHL and not be the best player. No, but you still got to do it on the ice. Oh, for sure. You but still got to do it on I'm the ice. I'm assuming that. I'm yeah, assuming yeah. that a guy who, I mean, you don't so put up those he's going to have to be Patrick Kane yes. with his personality. That's right. right. Uh, yeah. Jack Hughes is not going to flop. Capo Hacko is not going to flop. You don't these think, guys are the you real deal. Think, yeah. uh, you're not putting up these. No, I mean, no. Okay, we all no. said this about Neil Yakubov. I, I get, it. I get it, I get it. I get, I'm, you know, playing back this tape in five years. Maybe I look like an idiot. I'm gonna look like an idiot. Anyways, that's fine. Um, but to me, he's gonna produce. So to have a guy who can be the face of the league, I think that that yeah. counts for yeah. something. Yeah. Um, Kenny, it's hot take time. I like to call call this uh, segment. Ken is wrong. Okay. Well, that's nice of you. <laughs> Holy cow. Okay, well, I think I'm watching these playoffs, and I, I think there's going to be a time when Brad Marchand gets his face smashed in. I think that's going to happen <laughs> These someday. playoffs? No, just someday it's okay. going to happen. Yeah. And in my opinion, the NHL is going to have Brad Marchand's blood on its hands because it has done nothing to deter Brad Marchand for ask, acting the way he does. And so now this is where you get the league won't do anything about it. So so we're going to have to do something about it. So somebody's going to have to do something about it. I'm not sure Brad Marchand's going to get his face caved in. He's the kind of guy that like these guys never seem to this never seems to happen to them because they're so aware of where they are and they never make themselves vulnerable. But I just got to think at some point somebody's going to take advantage of him turning his back at some point and it's just going to level him. I think Brad Marchand is lucky that he lives in the NHL of nowadays because there <laughs> yeah. ain't a lot of mm. fat face right. smashers right. around. Right. Yeah. But I, I just I just if this if this does happen my point is is that I think the NHL is going to have his blood on their hands because they have refused to do anything about what Brad Marchand has done and 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 what he represents. Like like this last one was to me was just laughable. You know, Gary Bettman says, "We told him it's not acceptable." Okay. No penalty, no suspension, no fine. What part about that is not acceptable? Right. And that if he ever does it again, <laughs> He's going to be in for a suspension. For a guy who's got you. a proven track record. I mean, come on. Yeah, That's yeah. the clever thing about Brad Marchand is he never does the same thing too often. Right. Like he right. did the lick it twice. Yeah, he, but he mixes it up. It's like, okay, don't step on a guy's stick anymore. No problem. Yeah, don't yeah. rabbit punch a guy in the back of the head. No problem. Yeah. Don't do that. It's like, what else have you come? How did you get a paint can on the ice? <laughs> What's going on here, Brad? Next time you hit somebody with a paint can, you're but definitely Justin, getting suspended. Justin Williams must be going like... <clears throat> Like, seriously? <laughs> like, look who I did it to. Come yeah. on. I took his chin strap off, for God's sakes. Yeah. Why are you giving me a penalty for that? Yeah. So, should, do you, I know what Ken thinks. Do you think he should have been suspended for the punch? Oh, yeah. So, that's, that's a universal thing, then. Yeah. Well, not quite. I mean, some people don't think it was even a minor penalty. See, to me, the referee to me, I mean, that. like, you can't, you can't suspend a guy based on the act, right? Like, you can't give him a long suspension based on the act. You have to, each act has to be looked at in, in isolation, right? right? That's the way it's right. supposed and, to Yeah, be. And, and, but so the question is, did that rise to the level of a suspendable offense? Yes. And in the NHL's mind, it didn't, and that's where, that's where the whole, all the logic falls through for me. Mm. Yeah. I, to me, you can't pretend to care about players' safety, especially concussions. Right, right. Which, with all the principal point of contact, head stuff, yada, 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 Total hypocrisy with fighting. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. But you can't pretend to care about it and not right. suspend so, it. So regardless who does that, whether it's Brad Marchand or the guy who's going to win the anyway. Lady Bing trophy this year, um, regardless who, do, who does that, you look at it in isolation and you say, okay, this is worth some form of supplementary discipline. So then, then you get to look at the record after that. And then you go, oh, it was Brad Marchand. This fits. Okay, then he gets a game or two games. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's basically... Whereas normally it, it would have been a yeah. fine or, or yeah. something for somebody. For Brad Marchand, it's not a fine. It's more than that. 
Yeah, that that's fair. Okay, and uh, Kenny, I'm, I'm I'm sorry, you weren't wrong there. No, thanks. So, yeah. no, well, even even a blind even a archer, bro- even a blind even archer finds a bullseye once in a even while. Even a broken clock. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Future Watch, uh, Mort Sider, Riley. Tell us yes. about that kid. Okay, so you know because we were talking about Capo Caco and Jack Hughes, there's another draft eligible player. Yep in the World Championship, and that is Moritz Sider, the defenseman for Germany. Uh, already has a goal in the tournament, playing on a second pairing, getting you know some, some good exposure here. I'm very intrigued by Sider because you know we haven't seen German prospects like him very often. We certainly haven't seen German prospects playing in the DEL in their draft year. You know, yeah. Leon Dreisaitl, uh, a more elite talent, you know, I'll, I'll say that right now. Uh, you know, he was playing in Prince Albert, and then Kelowna in the WHL. So with Sider, you know, playing against men back home, uh, had some injuries this year, so he wasn't always available for scouts to see, but great size, great 2A blue liner. You know, there's a lot of upside there. Um, I'm very intrigued to see how high he goes in this draft because yeah. there isn't a consensus on who the best defenseman is in the draft. You know, Bowen Byram's the obvious uh, candidate, but then there's other people that say it might be Philip Broberg. Uh, they like the upside there. And then you have to think about guys like Sider and Thomas Harley and Victor Soderstrom. So I could see Sider going in the 10 to 15 range yeah. if there's a run on defensemen or simply put, if a, if a team really likes what they see in him. So he's still playing hockey with the Germans, so that's great he, for scouts. Uh, he drove the scouts nuts this year because they would come to see him and he wouldn't be in the lineup half the yeah. time. But then he really turned it on like in the second half of the year. And I think part of it was was when he went to the World Junior, mm-hmm. the uh, Group 2 or B-Pool, yeah, whatever, the division and he there. dominated. He yeah. dominated at that tournament, and and I think that was sort of where things turned around for yeah, him. Yeah, and they got promoted because of right, him, right. Uh, among other players. And what's really nice is that, so next year Germany will be at the real World Juniors, you know, quote unquote, but I, I actually think the Germans are going to be pretty good because they'll have Sider, they'll have Dominic German. Bach, the St. Louis Blues first rounder, they got a couple of other kids like Taro Jinch, they'll be available, so I don't think they're going to be pushovers, and for Sider, there's a chance for him, you know, once he's drafted, to play like 25 you know, maybe even more a game. Um, so that'll be fun. Uh, as for drafted prospects, got to go with Nick Suzuki, the Montreal Canadiens prospect, acquired in the Max Pacioretty deal from Vegas. 42 points in 24 <laughs> games in the OHL playoffs. Ridiculous. Guelph had the most crazy run. You know, swept Kitchen in the first round. We're down three games to none to London. Came back. We're down three to one in game seven. Then won six three. They play Saginaw. Saginaw goes up two nothing, but their goalie gets suspended in the second game for the rest of the series for batting the puck into the crowd. Guelph comes back to win. Then in the final, they go down two nothing to Ottawa. Mikey DiPietro gets hurt for the 67s, so they have to put in their backup goaltender. Guelph ends up winning in six. I was at game four, Nick Suzuki playing on the line with Isaac Ratcliffe, the Flyers pick, and Mackenzie Entwistle, the Chicago Blackhawks prospect, and they were just dominating Ottawa's one of, they have, Ottawa had two top lines, uh, but the one with Ty Fellhaber and Marco Rossi was the one that Suzuki was, was matched up against. They just dominated them. Um, I mean, the Suzuki line had the puck all the time when they were on the ice. Suzuki had three points that night. He also broke the Guelph Storm playoff record for scoring at the time. And then he just, you know, at the time the record was 35 for Martin St. Pierre. So he had 36 that night, finished the series, of, now it's 42 over the course of the playoffs. They're going to the Memorial Cup. And it's funny because they weren't the favorite going into the playoffs. But you look at the roster, it's like, wow, they're actually pretty deep there. It really came together. They loaded up too. They loaded up. Yeah, yeah. But they came together, and as many times as they were almost dead in the playoffs, they managed to get through. And now you're looking at a team that, you know, they only got to win a couple more games to win that Memorial Cup. I'm not saying they're the favorite, but Nick Suzuki is going to be a huge factor in that Memorial Cup tournament. Yep. Montreal Canadiens fans must be very happy. Uh, another player who's going to make some team very happy, and I want to know a little bit more about Ken, is Dylan Cousins, our projected number three pick right. uh, in our draft preview issue, which should hopefully be in the hands of most subscribers or on newsstands right now if you want to pick up a copy. Uh, interesting backstory with Cousins. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, the fact that he's from Whitehorse is, is pretty interesting, but a lot of people know that already. 
Um, I got to, I talked to him a little bit before he uh, went for the uh, world under 18s. And uh, it, it's interesting because the fact that he's from Whitehorse is, is kind of not even the most interesting thing about him. Mm. His, his mother's from Jamaica and she trains for marathons in the middle of the winter in Whitehorse. Uh, his dad was an electrician in Lethbridge, went to law school, uh, decided to, uh, you know, decided to go to law school, you know, and then now he's, now, then he became a lawyer, now he's a judge in Whitehorse. Um, and, and it was interesting, there was, uh, when he was in Pee Wee, I think, they, the way they do it, there's so little competition there that when you play for the quote-unquote all-star team or the, the, the rep team, for that town, you play a, a um, you play a division up in the next house league, right? So he was playing Pee Wee, but he was also always he was actually on the Bantam team. The Bantam team actually plays against a men's league team, like a like a bunch of guys like yeah. me, you know. <laughs> and so, anyways, he's he has a breakaway. A guy falls on his leg, shatters his leg, breaks it in like fifty thousand places. Anyways, he has a growth spurt while his leg is broken, and and then the next thing you know, he's the six foot three guy who's who's just a horse and a really soft-spoken, but really, uh, really well-spoken kid. Um, good, great background, um, really works. Like that, that seems to be the thing that scouts have talked to me about most about him is that he just never, ever, like his, his drivetrain is always going. He never gives up. His engine's always going. So a kid that could end up being a pretty interesting guy. Mm -hmm. A ghost potentially, or maybe producer Steven. <laughs> I don't know which one. I look down and look, and suddenly yeah. draft preview had appeared. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> and there it is. Uh, beautiful. Our first perfect bound edition as well. Which, right uh, for those of you who don't know, no more staples. Mm -hmm. Get that beautiful perfect bound glossy cover. There it is, right there. Kenny, you wrote the Jack Hughes story. Got the Dylan Cousins story. Uh, Pick that up for our rankings as well. Has uh, some great reads of the top three prospects in the draft. Uh, mailbag. Got Jordan asking, is this the end for Joe Thornton, Ryan? Only if the Sharks win the Cup. I think if they don't win the Cup, he'll come back for one more year. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. It's starting to look like the end, though, isn't it? Yeah. I think he's actually playing pretty yeah, well. He's like, he's still yeah, defensively yeah. responsible. Yeah, yeah. He's slow. No yeah, yes, slow. yes, yeah. But I'm but pretty, I mean, I'm when pretty your knee's been too. reconstructed like that and, sure. and everything, that's, yeah. that's to be expected. Um, still can throw a vicious elbow with the best of them. Yes, he can. <laughs> and I, you know, I mean, I, the, the, one thing I, the one thing I worry about with, with uh, San Jose is, like, I hope they don't just get this, like, let's win it for Joe. Thornton, <laughs> as opposed to Pavelski, yeah. um, you know, because then you start putting a lot of pressure on yourself. But, I mean, they've handled it pretty well so far. If they get to the final, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a person that would not be cheering for the San Jose Sharks, other than if Boston gets there, like all of Boston Bruin fans would be like, F Joe, who cares? Yeah, of course, yeah. We want to win the cup. But, but I think everyone else will be like, we want to see Joe win, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know? I mean, and it's hard to argue against that sentiment. Guy's a Hall of Famer, great guy. Um, you know, he's been, he's, he's, he basically has, you know, established the culture in San Jose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a guy that's just, a, a guy you want to see get that, get that prize. Is there- The any, Ray Bork, if you will, you know? Yes. Any chance, any chance that Joe says, I want to keep playing, I'm worth my $4 million, my $5 million. Mm -hmm. I, I deserve that. San Jose can't afford them. They want, they want to bring Eric Carlson back. Right, and they've got to and sign Joe Pavelski. Tons yeah. of other guys yeah. to sign. Yeah, Pavelski yeah. might even be an odd man out there. Yeah. Is there any chance that Joe comes back not in a San Jose uniform? Yes, yeah. I believe so. I believe there is because I think Joe Thornton's the kind of guy that needs 31 teams to tell him he's no good. Yeah. Okay. He needs... He, Hockey he, life. He, yeah, yeah. He, he needs... I, I, unless unless he wins the cup and says I want to go out on top and that's it. Yeah. But but I've talked to Joe. I I don't I don't profess to know him real well, but I, I know him a little bit. He's one of those guys that you're going to have to peel the stuff the, the equipment off of him. And you're and there's like I said, there's going to have to be 31 teams out there that say it's over, Joe. Well, then it's to over. me, then to me, I wonder if it's you win your cup and then you don't have to stay in San Jose. You go and you do your I still Maybe. want to play yeah. tour, but I can play for any team I want Maybe. to. Maybe. Not that San Jose wouldn't be the team you want to play mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. you know. And and uh, very to me, if you're in that kind of mindset, you don't. If you just want to play, you come back for a mil and a half. 
Yeah, totally. You signed a and Char. he would, and he would, he would. Yeah. I mean, Char's back for two next year, right? But the one yeah. thing you keep forgetting there, he's he's also got two and a half in easily achievable right. performance right. bonuses. Right. So it's actually right. fine. Yeah. 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 Um, anyways, I digress. Uh, Gotham Intel HQ. Nice. Is that is that sure. Twitter? Sure. Sure. Let's go with that. Okay. <laughs> Will the NHL ever go to Olympic-sized ice? No, they won't. That's been the podcast for this week. Hooray! Well, first of all, it's international-sized ice, not Olympic-sized ice. Okay, right. well, the, the um, Gotham Intel well, yeah. Yeah. Come on, Gotham! Secondly, no. Okay, Secondly, Intel's no. Set. Secondly, no. Yeah. And thirdly, no. Yeah. Like, never. Yeah. And why would they? And It's a know, great question. Really good one to put <laughs> on the lineup, Steve. Well, no, because people, people need to know. No, because, it, I, mean, it, I mean, I think what makes the NHL so special is that these guys have the ability to do these amazing things in confined spaces. Mm -hmm. I think the confined space is what makes the NHL so exciting. Oh, yeah. I think the bigger the ice, the more boring the game. Oh, it's totally. Yeah, like, totally. Like it, Isn't there a half? I mean, Burke, there might Brian, be a hybrid. Brian yes, Burke has yes. come out and talked yes. about how, and, and, and to his credit, he said he's been beating the drum for this for two decades. Right. And every new arena that's been built, he's saying, take out a couple of roads we want to go. Right. Just not quite Olympics, but right. just another, I think it's three or five feet. I don't remember specifically. Right, right. Doesn't that... I mean, I know it's been said and said again. Dudes are five inches bigger and 30 pounds heavier now. Mm -hmm. And we're still playing on the same size ice. Right. But the game right. is still exciting. And I think why that is, is that you had the obstruction crackdown, you had the slashing crackdown. So I, I totally get the idea that the players are so much bigger. But mm -hmm. I mean, the speed of the game is better than it ever has been. I also think that that conversation with owners would be like, Hey, uh, so I was thinking if you could take three or five rows of seats out of your arena. Hello. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. 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 Hello. Yeah. 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 But I, I think I think that that this is not it's not a it's not a, a quality of play issue. It's a safety issue. I, I think the size of the ice is okay. a safety issue mm. because because as you said, the game is so fast now, uh. played by such big players. I think you give them a little bit more room out there. You don't have all these collisions that end up ending up with these. Catastrophic injuries with concussions. I think if if there's a if there's a case to be made for a bigger rink, it's in it's on the safety, safety side. side. It's okay. not on the entertainment value side. It's on the player safety side. Okay, well then oh, yeah. then then they're absolutely not going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, that's it for the podcast this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Got Ken Campbell here. Got Ryan Kennedy. I'm Edward Fraser. Thanks very much for listening.